Welcome back to the playlist on heme synthesis and cytochrome P450. In this video, we're going to look at this enzyme, which is called uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase. And what it's going to do is it's going to do this transformation. It's going to take hydroxymethyl bilane and convert it into uroporphyrinogen 3. We'll analyze the structures in just a few minutes, but I want to give you some background information on this enzyme. Let's talk a little bit about the genetics of this enzyme, okay? If you have a deficiency of this enzyme, number one, you're not going to be able to do this transformation of converting hydroxymethyl bilane into uroporphyrinogen 3, okay? And what you'll develop is this disease called congenital erythropoietic porphyria, okay? Now, congenital erythropoietic Congenital erythropoietic porphyria is an autosomal recessive disorder. What that means is that in order to express this disease, you're going to have to be homozygous recessive for the disease. So basically, uh, you get two alleles for this, and this little one, this lowercase a, I'm representing as the allele that basically codes for congenital erythropoietic porphyria. And so um, if you're heterozygous uh, for this genotype, you will not express congenital erythropoietic porphyria. You have to be homozygous recessive. So, for example, the, the typical example that's given is if you have two heterozygous parents, then you basically do a Punnett square. So here's perhaps the male, this is the female right here, mother and father, and you do the Punnett square and you find essentially that you have one child that's going to be homozygous dominant, in which case they will neither be an expressor or a carrier of the disease. And then you'll theoretically have a 50% chance of having, um, of having a child that's heterozygous for this disease. Uh, they will not express the disease, but they'll be a carrier for it, uh, just like their parents are. And then the bad part is that you have one-fourth of a chance of having a child who expresses congenital erythropoietic porphyria. And that's what we did know with the two lowercase a's. Your homozygous recessive for the alleles that, can, that express congenital erythropoietic porphyria. Okay, and it's just like your uh, typical porphyrias. You get things like nausea, constipation, uh, vomiting, things like that. And then also you have lots of skin problems that develop and you have trouble being out in the sunlight uh, you get things like blistering, scarring, lesions, all sorts of nasty things. Um, another name for this disease, there's another name for it, it's called Gunther's disease. And it's named after a German, a German chemist who basically discovered the disease. So this is also called Gunther's disease. Okay, And on top of all those those symptoms that I just mentioned, um, probably the biggest thing that happens when you have a deficiency of any of the enzymes in heme synthesis is, of course, you can't synthesize heme, or at least you have trouble uh, synthesizing it because you have deficiency of some enzyme in the pathway. Okay, And so basically what will end up happening is if you have a deficiency of uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase, you're going to be accumulating a lot of hydroxymethyl bilane. Okay? And that's what leads to a lot of the symptoms that you have. Okay, Now, doing some analysis structures on hydroxymethyl bilane versus uroporphyrinogen 3, um, you should note several things. Okay, Number one, notice how hydroxymethyl bilane has not been completely cyclized. right? Because you still have, essentially, this hydroxymethyl group that sort of sticks off of the A ring. Right? If we're to label the pyrrole rings, this is A, this is B, this is C and this is D. That's sort of the convention for porphyrins, okay, and corins as well. But hydroxymethyl bilane has not been cyclized. So what uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase is going to do is, number one, it's going to cyclize it into what we call a cyclic tetrapyrrole. So uroporphyrinogen 3 is what we call a cyclic tetrapyrrole, okay? Now, hydroxymethyl bilane is a tetrapyrrol, but it's not cyclic. It's basically just a chain of tetrapyrroles. It has not yet been cyclized, so this enzyme number one is going to make it cyclic. The other thing that this enzyme is going to do, and we'll look at the mechanism of how that happens, is it's going to invert the D-ring. Okay, so notice that in hydroxymethyl bilane, if you look at it in this orientation, notice how the propionate group right here, the one that has three carbons, this propionate group is sort of right here. Okay, but notice that when you look at the uroporphyrinogen 3, the propionate group has essentially been moved to right here. 
Okay, so in one case, in hydroxymethylbilane, it's proximal to the A ring, whereas in uroporphyrin 3, it's distal from the A ring. So essentially what's going to happen is this enzyme is going to invert the D ring. Okay, now also notice that we still have four pyrrole rings, but each of the pyrrole rings is not conjugated to the other one. So there's a discontinuity between, between the rings. Okay, so notice in uroporphyrin 3, at this point, at this point, at this point, and at this point, at those four points, there's a discontinuity in the p orbital system, so it's not continuous. So that means that there's no continuous conjugation of pi electrons throughout the whole ring. You can basically view this ring, therefore, as four completely electronic independent pyrrole rings. The first case in tetrapyrrole synthesis where we see the complete conjugation throughout the entire porphyrin ring, that's once we use protoporphyrinogen oxidase to give us protoporphyrin. That's the penultimate step in heme synthesis, and we haven't gotten there yet. So up until we get to protoporphyrinogen oxidase, we're going to view these rings as four separate pyrrole rings because there's a discontinuity at each of those purple carbons, okay? So the p orbital system is not continuous, okay? And so this is the transformation that occurs. So without boring you any further, let's actually look at the mechanism of how that occurs. Okay, so basically, again, this right here, this is your hydroxymethylbilane right here, and I'll do the mechanistic steps in green, okay? So basically, the first step of what's going to happen is you're going to get a cyclization, okay? So what's essentially going to happen is this. The way you can view this step is a really, really rapid process um, where you don't generate any significantly unstable intermediates. So in some order, basically, this bond is going to break, abstract this proton from the pyrrole, and that's essentially going to force a double bond rearrangement. And then these electrons right here that I'm going to highlight in yellow, these electrons right here are going to essentially come out um, and they're going to basically hit this carbon and that would essentially initiate the loss of this hydroxide which will eventually leave as this water right here. Okay, And in fact that water is going to be used in the catalysis as we'll see later on. Okay, so this process happens so quickly right here that you can essentially view it all as a concerted process, okay? So you don't end up generating really any highly, highly unstable intermediates, okay? So this is like a concerted eight electron movement, okay? And that's going to give you a water that will be catalytic in nature, and then you're also going to generate this uh, very strange intermediate in which we actually have cyclized it now. But what we're going to find is in this next step, we're actually going to decyclize it again, but at a different point. So now what's going to happen is you have this lone pair here on this pyrrole of the C ring. And what's going to happen is we're going to form a protonated shift base. So these electrons are going to kick in here to, to form a double bond here or a shift base. Then you get an electronic rearrangement. These pi electrons come here to form a double bond here. And then what's going to happen is you're going to essentially get loss of a leaving group. Okay, so this bond breaks, and then this comes in here and forms a bond. This rearranges to here, and then these pi electrons come out and abstract a proton from water, and that generates this guy right here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use these electrons right here, and we're going to initiate formation of a protonated shift base. Okay, and what we're essentially going to do is we're going to reform the bond here between the C ring right here and the D ring. So we kick these electrons in here to form a protonated shift base. These electrons rearrange like this, and then these right here, which I'll highlight in orange, these electrons right here are going to perform a nucleophilic attack on this carbon right here, which I'm labeling in red. So this carbon gets nucleophilically attacked, and the reason it's so susceptible to nucleophilic attack is because this protonated shift base on the C ring can act as an electron sink. So the, these pi electrons come in here, these rearrange right here, and then these pi electrons right here that I'm highlighting in purple, these get abstracted by this nitrogen because they're able to act as an electron sink. 
okay? And then we get this product that's shown right here. And then we're going to have one more step to give us Euro Pork Run Engine 3. But there is one thing I want to point your attention to, and that's this, is we originally generated this water in the active site. But notice how in the formation of the D-ring um, that's been inverted, we originally deprotonated that water. So all we have left is this hydroxide right here. Okay, so that hydroxide remained in the active site and it's apparent right here in this mechanism. Okay, so what's going to happen is there's going to be a proton exchange with this tetrapyrrole right here. So hydroxide is going to come in here and deprotonate right here, and that's going to cause these electrons to form pi electrons right here. And we get an electronic rearrangement, and this protonated shift base once again is going to act as an electron sink. And that right there, that's going to give us this guy, and we would recognize this guy as Euro, Europorphyrinogen 3. Okay? Europorphyrinogen 3. And what I want to just have you re recognize once again, and I'll go back here to look at the net reaction, okay? Europorphyrinogen 3, we've essentially inverted the D ring. So another way of looking at it is, I'll do this in pink is that this acetyl group right here, which was in hydroxymethylmyelane distal to the A ring, now this acetyl group is now proximal to the A ring, so it's now closer. And so what we've effectively done to it is we've cyclized it along with inverting the positions of the propionate group and the acetyl group on the D ring, okay? So now we have Europorphyrinogen 3. What I want to do now is get a little perspective on Europorphyrinogen 3 in humans. And in humans, we're basically going to be synthesizing three main hemes from this. Okay, so Europorphyrinogen 3 in humans basically can go into, number one, the initial heme that's made is heme B, but you can also make heme A. And heme A would be used in some enzymes like cytochrome C oxidase. Um, that has two heme A's in it. And then there's also one enzyme that I know of called cytochrome C that uses a heme C. So those are the main things that are done in humans. Okay, those are the main hemes that are made. But there are some other organisms out there that can process this, process Europorphyrinogen 3 in different ways. For example, other organisms could make something like cyroheme. Cyroheme is another type of coenzyme that's used in electron transfers. And then there's another one that's really special that is not made in humans, but it's actually used in humans, and that's something called cobalamin. And you might be more familiar with hearing cobalamin written as vitamin B12. Okay, Vitamin, vitamin B12 is not made in humans. It's made in bacteria, but it's something that ultimately ends up in herbivores and things like that through their bacteria, and we of course eat the herbivores as meat, and then that's how we get most of our B12 is from animal products. So B12 is used in basically two reactions in humans, that's methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, and then it's also used in methionine synthase, also called homocysteine S-methyl transferase. Okay, so there's two main enzymes used in humans. Cyroheme is not used in humans, as far as anyone can tell. But heme B, heme A, heme C, and cobalamin are all used in humans. But cyroheme is not made in humans. Cobalamin is not made in humans. But of course, humans use vitamin B12. And all of these guys come from this special product, Europorphyrinogen 3. Okay, so I hope this video gave you a little bit of perspective on Europorphyrinogen 3 and its synthesis from hydroxymethylbilane by Europorphyrinogen 3 synthase. See you in the next video. In the next video, we're going to look at the decarboxylation of Europorphyrinogen 3, and we'll find that it actually is an enzyme that possesses the highest rate enhancement of any enzyme in nature. See you soon.